Hi, everyone. Welcome to Global Online Academy's second webinar with a guest speaker for Do Monuments Matter? My name is Eric Hudson. Uh, I'm from Global Online Academy, and I'm here to introduce our guest speaker, Jennifer Wood. Uh, Jennifer Wood is currently in France, but based in Germany, and she's been involved in remembrance culture, public history, and compassionate action for over 20 years. She teaches 20th century European history through authentic historical sites, memorials, and museums. Um, creative expression and mindfulness are also essential to her approach. She has worked in classrooms in Africa, Europe, and the United States. And she's going to be talking through a little bit the handout that's posted in the class right above her image. So if you go into the class uh, to the guest speaker section in week two, you can find a link to her handout. In addition, we have Diane Krishan, uh, who is one of our facilitators. He'll be joining Jennifer for a brief conversation um, after she finishes talking through her handout. So for now, Diane and I are going to mute ourselves and go away. And Jennifer is going to talk for a little bit about her work and practice. Jennifer, I'll hand it over to you. Great. Eric, thank you. Dion, thank you also for being here. It's nice to be with you all today. And um, basically, as you see on the handout that I put together, our intention today is actually for me to introduce two internationally recognized Holocaust memorials that are connected to the Nazi genocide from 1933 until 1945 in Germany as well as a learning center that is located at one of the former SS headquarter areas in Berlin. And the idea is to simply introduce these memorials and also introduce this learning center as an example of the remembrance culture that has actually been cultivated um, in Germany since 1945, since the end of the Second World War. Um, Eric shared a bit about my background, and I would like to go into a little bit more detail about that. Um, I am a U.S. citizen, but I've been living in Germany for about 15 years, and I grew up on the west coast of the States. And when I was in eighth grade, I was actually attending a middle school in Portland, Oregon. And we had a teacher on our staff there who was actually one of the teachers that worked with the students who had disabilities. And he came into our social studies classroom one day during the time that we were learning about the Second World War. We had read the play that was based on Anne Frank's diary. And this was actually in the mid 80s. This was about 1984, uh, so a long time ago. And he came in and actually spoke about his mother's experience surviving the Nazi concentration camp system. His mother was a Jew and she had been born in the Czech Republic. And as her child, he was actually, when asked to do so, he was sharing his mother's story with young people. And this story really was the spark for my interest in human rights and my interest in civil rights, my interest in Holocaust history. And it's ultimately actually what, what led me to Germany and sort of created this whole life of studying German history, studying um, to become a teacher as well, and I actually recently gave a TEDx talk, and the link is also in my profile on our Canvas site. So you're invited to take a look at that talk that I did a couple of years ago, um, because basically that links my, my active work, working, with, working as an educator in the former concentration camps in Germany. So basically in Germany, these former camps are now learning centers, their museums, and tens of thousands of people each year, uh, German, European, people from all over the world visit Germany to actually see the places where the Holocaust actually happened. And so one way to think about Germany's memorials, Germany's monuments, and all of these learning centers is that they have really sort of transformed much of their history. And now so many people are able to visit these authentic sites and actually learn about what happened during the Nazi period, again, from 1933 to 1945. Um, so I hope that that gives you some context and some more framework for, for me and for my background. And I also would encourage you, for those of you who are online with us live right now, 
um, as I'm speaking the next, the next few minutes, please do consider any questions that you might have. I'd be happy to, to respond to those. Um, so again, our focus in this course is we're exploring why do monuments spark such emotional reactions in us? What are the beliefs and the values that underlie these symbols? And why do we memorialize certain people and places and events and not others? And how do we make, how do we make these decisions? Um, on the PDF, you will notice that there are three pictures. There is, and I'll actually pull them up as well on my screen so that you can see them here. Let's see, let me just click over. Sorry, I'm just clicking there. Okay, so the first image that you the first image that you see on my handout is, and let me just type this in, is the Jewish Holocaust Memorial that is in the center of Berlin. And here on my Google screen, you can see many, you can see many different pictures actually of what these look like. These are actually called slabs, these sort of um, concrete blocks that you see. This is a memorial for the six million Jews that were killed during the Nazi time period, again, from 33 until 45. These are all of the people that were killed in ghettos and in camps and everyone who died, all of the Jews, again, who died during this time. These slabs, there are actually 2,711, so there are many. This takes up a large space that is just in the city center. So you are within walking distance actually of the American embassy, of a big shopping area, of the sort of central park to Berlin, which is called the Tiergarten. You're also very close to the parliament building and of course the famous Brandenburg Gate. So it's really embedded into the topography of the, um, of the city. I would also like to highlight two things actually about, well, three things actually about the memorial. One of the things that we're doing in this course is we're exploring different terms. And on my handout, I have the terms monument, memorials, and then the German word. It's sometimes very difficult to actually to talk about all of the German remembrance culture without using German terms. So the third one is actually man mal. And I wanted to highlight that the word man, M-A-H-N, actually in German means warning. And so the official name actually for this memorial is this is the memorial to the murdered Jews of Europe. That is the official title, and I will say that one more time. This is the memorial to the murdered Jews of Europe. And um, when the memorial was actually being, was actually being um, built and being designed, um, the architect actually, his name is Peter, Peter Eisenman, um, when this was all being designed, the sort of catchphrase for it was actually called the Manmal because it was actually meant to serve as a warning, not only to the Germans themselves, but also for future generations actually worldwide, because of course there is so much focus on the genocide that happened from 1933 to 1945. Um, with that being said, the other thing point that I would like to highlight about the memorial. One of the reasons why it's also um, important is because during this time period, there are six million Jews who were killed in the concentration camp system. There were also five million non-Jews that were also killed for different reasons. So the, when you think about the five million non-Jewish victims, you think about political prisoners, there were journalists, there were professors at universities who spoke out against the Nazi ideas, of course, authors and other politicians as well that were basically political activists against the Nazis. Gay men were persecuted, in some cases as well, lesbian women. Also the gypsies, which actually the politically correct term for gypsy people is the Sinti and the Roma. They were also like the Jews, considered to be a race of people by the Nazi regime. And they were also, if you will, systematically killed in the camp system. And another important group to consider actually as well are all of the people who had physical and mental disabilities. The Nazi idea, many of you I'm sure know, was to create this very strong, sometimes in English we say superhuman race 
that would be um, very powerful and ultimately have power and control over the world. And so anyone that had physical disabilities and mental disabilities were considered too weak, if you will, for German society. They too were also systematically killed actually within the Nazi camp system. So these are some examples of the non-Jewish people that were also considered to be victims of Nazi persecution. And back to the Jewish Memorial in Berlin, what's important is, is to consider all 11 million victims of Nazi persecution. So this monument, this memorial for the center of Berlin, the focus, of course, will always be for the Jewish victims. However, um, when you travel a little bit, just you can take um, very short walks, actually, to three other memorials. There's one other memorial close by for the, um, for the Sinti and Roma, for the gypsies. And I will um, type that in. It actually comes right up, Sinti and Roma Memorial in Berlin. So just a few steps away towards the Brandenburg Gate and then on to the Germany's Parliament Building, you actually see this very sort of soft, round pool of water. And this is the memorial for the Sinti and Roma. And the numbers, by the way, they believe, the historians say that there's approximately 500,000 Sinti and Roma who were also killed in the camp system. And then the next one that I would like to share is the Homo Denkmal Berlin. So this uh, sort of square block, there's a small window there in the center. And when you look inside this window, you actually see the video of uh, different couples, different homosexual couples that are kissing. And so this is the memorial to remember the homosexual victims of Nazi persecution. And then the third one that I would like to highlight is this one. So you see this blue screen and you see sort of this long um, concrete sort of table. This is actually in a way sort of a learning center. There's all kinds of documents and pictures in German and in English. This is the more memorial that is focusing on the euthanasia program as it was called uh, for all of the physically and the mentally disabled people in Germany that were killed. So what I'd like to, again, just tie that all back to the Jewish memorial, that this is actually a network in the core of Berlin. And just as a reminder that Berlin is Germany's capital city. This is a network of memorials to recognize and acknowledge and remember the genocide that was happening between 33 and 45 and the focus on all of these different groups, not only the 6 million Jewish victims. Um, I'm curious if there are any questions so far or if I should just go ahead and, and continue. If there's any questions so far, you can go ahead and send those in. No questions yet, but participants no questions yet. Okay. are welcome to use the Q&A button to submit Good. questions okay. as they have them. Dion, did you have, any, um, did you have any questions? Was any new information there or anything that was not clear that I can make more clear perhaps about the Jewish Memorial? Sure, Jennifer. I'm interested in the fact that there are four uh, memorials seemingly juxtaposed uh, were they all um, established by the groups that are oh. the ancestors of the victims? Yeah. Um, and wondering if the, if the Berlin local government or the German government had any, any say in, in the positioning. And also the interesting thing for me that they're all separated uh, and uh -huh. not... Yeah. not memorialized together. So those are the things I was thinking about when you were talking. Okay, good, good. Um, let me answer the second one first because it's kind of more of a logistical, it's more of a logistical spatial question. Um, the Jewish Memorial was actually open to the public in 2005. So it's about 12 years old. And it opened in 2005 to the public to mark the 60th anniversary, actually, of the end of the Second World War. So the fact that they are all detached, which is a fantastic observation, they're all detached, but at the same time, they're, um, they're together in the same area. But this allows people, like when you actually visit, this allows people, visitors, actually some downtime between them to sort of process and absorb and let everything settle. 
Um, and at the same time, it also allows each particular group, if you will, to have their own sort of their own space for the memorialization. Um, this this other question, though, I'm so glad that you that you bring it up around how did the memorials essentially sort of how did they come to be and who was sort of behind the inception and the ideas of these is, is what I'm hearing you ask. And the idea for the Jewish memorial actually already um, was created by a, it was really from a grassroots organization. And this is something really important to highlight because in former West Germany, remember, you know, about 25, 30 years ago when Germany was still divided as a country, in former West Germany in the 80s, there was already quite a bit of activity for, um, for memorialization and for learning actually about the Nazi time. So if you think about the war ending in 45, Many of the big camps, for example, Dachau, where I was working for three years near Munich, many of the big camps in West Germany were actually used as displaced persons camps. Um, in the case of Dachau, Dachau was used as a DP camp by the American military, actually, for 20 years. So the concentration camp ends in the summer of 1945, the spring of 45, when the war ends, the American military takes over, uses it as a DP camp for 20 years. And then in 1965, it becomes a public uh, memorial, basically for people to come remember and learn. And so at 20 years later, in the mid 80s, West Germany, there are already starting to be university scholars, journalists, writers, survivors, children of survivors at that time that are already starting to have these ideas. Enough time has passed. We need to do something to protect these things, to protect these spaces. And already these ideas were starting to happen. So in the case of the Jewish Memorial in 1988, there were a group of local citizens at the time in, in West Germany that really wanted to build a national memorial for Germany, actually, for West Germany. Because remember, they didn't know that the wall was going to fall in 1989. That was the information that we have now that they did not have. And so then the idea, of course, as well with, within Germany, the typical framework for all of these memorials is definitely the perpetrator, the bystander, the victim. And I can't emphasize enough how that sort of, again, that framework, that context has basically been used to frame most of these memorials and these learning centers. And that being said, it was important to acknowledge the 6 million Jewish victims and create space for that memory, as well as the 5 million non-Jewish victims. And so it was after the Jewish memorial really started, the, and the planning, by the way, took years, actually. There was, um, there was a big competition, actually, an international competition among architects and among designers who would actually design it. And yes, the German government, the West German government at that time, and then after 89, the unified government was very much involved in all of the planning. And they also ultimately paid for it, of course. Um, all of these public memorials are also paid for by German tax money. Does that help clarify? Absolutely. Thank you. Okay, good, good. Did any other questions come in or should we jump into the stones, into the stumbling stones? So we do have one question from oh, good. a participant. Um, okay. How do you think the citizens of Berlin and greater Germany feel about the monuments? To what mm -hmm. extent do you think the government supports these monuments and what they mm -hmm. stand for? How invested are they apart from erecting these monuments to ensuring neo-Nazism doesn't return? So I guess that's three questions. Uh. Okay, so what I heard, Eric, were how, do, how does the German population respond? How do the people feel? How does the government support all of this? And then could you repeat the third part around the neo-Nazi piece? I'd like to hear that again. Sure. How invested is the government, um, mm -hmm. apart from erecting these monuments, to ensuring neo-Nazism doesn't return? Ah, uh, okay. Um, I think I'll do exactly what I did with Dion's question and start, uh, start from this last one around the neo-Nazis. Um, so neo-Nazism exists in Germany. There's no question. I'm sure that all of you are, um, especially taking a look at this, at your experiences in this course, it's just important to recognize that this sort of um, division that we are experiencing in the U.S. from a political point of view in terms of values or in terms of um, 
what we what we what we believe in, um, what we want for our society as well. Europe is also actually seeing some of these same some of these same divisions. You've all heard about Brexit, for example. So one of the things that I would say, as someone who, as a non-German who's lived in Germany for 15 years, um, neo-Nazism is something that exists in Germany. Um, contrary to popular belief, there is less of it than, than one would think. Um, I actually have several close friends who work in government-funded programs. So the government-funded programs that actually work through educational channels to reduce right extremist political behavior. So neo-Nazism is also, it's important to realize as well that neo-Nazis are not only skinheads with, with boots and shaved heads and tattoos and leather jackets. Um, in Germany, one of the first things that I learned was you do have those skinheads and that's one form of the neo-Nazi, if you will. But you also have um, the Germans will sometimes say all of the people with nice tweed jackets and elbow patches and, you know, very proper conservative clothes. And they, too, have extremely conservative political ideas about what Germany should be, about what the society should be, about what they su should support. Should Germany be inclusive? Um, of course, the current big, big question that is very challenging for the country is the issue of the refugees from the Middle East, mainly from Syria. Um, a couple of years ago, the Chancellor Angela Merkel um, opened Germany's doors and allowed over one million refugees to come into the country. And part of the German people are extremely welcoming to these refugees, very, very welcoming. And there are other parts of German society that are less welcoming to this to this refugee situation. Um, they they feel threatened. They feel fear that their way of life basically will be changed by the high numbers of the refugees coming into Germany. Um, the other thing to mention is that a couple of weeks ago, Germany also had national elections. So Angela Merkel will continue to be chancellor for another four years. However, Germany as well, it's important to know that um, Germany actually has a true multi-party democracy. I'll just say that one more time, because in the States, we're so acclimated to the, the Republicans and the Democrats. And then, you know, there might be, uh, we might have a couple of other smaller parties, but they're not really part of the part of the playing field, as it were. But Germany is a very different, a very different um, democracy in the sense that it's a multi-party system, a true functioning multi-party system. And national elections were about three or four weeks ago. Again, Merkel will be chancellor of the country. And however, the right extremist party, which is called the AFD, this means the Alternative für Deutschland, which means the alternative for Germany. This is actually the extreme right conservative um, neo-Nazi party, if you will. And it's an official party in parliament. And they actually had a much higher percentage of votes than... Um, than we were all expecting. And again, this is also just a quick thing around European politics, that this is the trend that the Europeans are seeing, that they are seeing the rise of these more conservative right extremist political parties are gaining more and more, um, more and more popularity and people are actually voting for them substantially. So Austria also just had elections and in the Austrian elections, their conservative party actually, actually won so um, it's just important to realize that this is happening in France, this is happening in some of the Scandinavian countries, and the Europeans are also sort of seeing this divide or seeing this split. Um, I do hope that that clarifies some of the issues around the neo-Nazis, but I'm happy to take more questions if there are. Um, and then just back to the, um, the original, the first part of that question around how do the people respond to these memorials and also around the government support. So the government support is definitely there. Um, the government, uh, Germany's government is extremely open around their history. Um, and it's actually something, you know, that they, that they actively work with. And these memorials and these monuments and these learning centers um, are actually all ways that the German society is working with their past and is confronting their past, actually, to learn from it. So um, a big role, of course, that the government plays is financing all of these projects. 
Um, another way that the government supports all of this sort of learning and this change and this transformation is also through educational educational methods, but the, the government really is representative and sort of models how they would like citizens to be responding actually to the history of the genocide. Um, and that again, in terms of the people's response, I think that I would like to sum it up by saying that most 80, 83, 84 million people live in Germany. Most Germans that are, I'm 45 years old, most Germans that are sort of my age or younger, um, are very clear about the facts of their history. They're very clear about the rise of Nazism, how all of this took place. Um, Holocaust history and, and understanding the Nazi systems from the 20s and the 30s is part of the German education system. So if you are, for example, um, in a typical German high school, all German high school students receive at least one and sometimes two full years of education around the Second World War. And so there is a very consistent narrative coming from Germany's education system around the rise of Hitler through the Nazi period and how everything happened. And all of this is backed by research and is backed by science. And even though it is not required for German teenagers to visit former concentration camps, in fact, many of them are taken with their school classes to former camps to um, also have that learning reinforced. I think I'll stop there and check in and see if there's any other questions. And, and I hope that that helped. Eric, was I clear? You were clear to me. Okay, good. Um, no other questions if you wanna move on. Uh, feel free. Sure. I'll Great. Questions that they come in. Good. Okay. So let's talk about these Stoppelsteiner, um, and I will pull those up as well. So these Stoppelsteiner, Stoppel actually means stumble. So and Stein is a stone, like a rock. And so these stones in English are sometimes called stumbling stones. And um, you see the picture on my handout, but you can also see them on my screen. And if you Google Stoppelsteiner, you'll actually find them. You can see that they are embedded actually into um, the sidewalk. So you see like the, the cobblestones around the actual gold stones. And the German that you see on each one, and, you know, and they're, about this, they're about this big. They're, they're really, the, the size that you see in the pictures is really the actual size. They're literally the size of kind of the standard cobblestone that you see in many German towns. And basically what you're seeing in each one is here wohnte means here lived, and then you've got the name of the person. And you've, the, the JG is the year that they were born. And then you have the word deportiert, which is the day that they, the date or the day that they were deported. Generally, we only have the year. And then it will tell you where the person was deported to. Um, and so this is where actually you will see all of the different camp names. And you will recognize probably some of them. Dachau and Buchenwald, Bergen-Belsen is the camp where Anne Frank died with her sister. And Auschwitz, of course. Um, you also sometimes see even more information if people were taken to different camps. You see the list of each camp or the ghetto where they were taken. Um, and the idea of the Stoppelsteiner, these are also about, the project is another one of these projects that was established as a, as a grassroots movement. And I'll tell you why. In Germany, and well, actually in many towns, you know, we often have like, like a, a plaque that says, um, you know, a particular famous person like lived in this house. And we often use that kind of a format to remember that someone lived somewhere. In Germany, there's a very interesting law. If you put a plaque on an apartment building, for example, which of course, you know, you're, um, Germany's about the size of Oregon and Washington, about the size of the Pacific Northwest, and again, about 84 million people. So it's densely populated, which means a lot of people live in apartment buildings. And when you put up one of these plaques on an apartment building, you actually need to have consensus from everyone living in that apartment building that it's okay to put up one of these memorial plaques on the side of the building. And inevitably, when um, 
when, for example, children or grandchildren wanted to have a plaque to remember that at first that a Jewish person once lived in that house, or maybe a famous scientist, for example, Albert Einstein or a famous writer. Um, what needed to happen is, is that, again, you needed to have sort of a vote of everyone living in the apartment building could be six people, could be 20 people, could be 50 people, but everyone living in the apartment building needed to say, yes, I'm okay, but the plaque is there at my front door. And inevitably, often it was the case that there would be people who said, no, I do not want to come home every day and see the sign that reminds me that there was a Jewish family who lived here and they were killed during this time. And there was, well, actually still the main artist who's doing this project is a, his last name is Demnich. His first name is Gunther. And he had the idea that if he put, if he created stones that could fit into the cobblestone streets, the sidewalks in Germany from a legal point of view are actually considered public space. And he did not need to have any approval as you did need approval from the people living in these buildings. You only needed city approval. And so this was actually a very, very creative way to still memorialize and remember the Jewish Holocaust victims who lived in all of these different houses across Germany. This was a very creative way to sort of get around that legal technicality. And today there are tens of thousands of these stones actually across Europe. So not only is the project contained to Germany, but it is now in Austria, it's now in the Czech Republic. I was in Rome last year and saw um, collections of stones in Rome as well. And so the project has actually also spread and it's really something, it's really something quite beautiful. And now, of course, we've got the digital version as well. So um, there, are, there, is a, there are different maps also that are connected to Google Maps. So if you're visiting Europe, you can actually um, connect in and see the different Stoppelsteiner that are actually in the area where you're visiting. Um, and one last thought that I would like to leave you on is that some of my, um, some of my German friends, they like to see the Jewish memorial of all of those slabs, which by the way are, you know, some of them that are in the center of that Jewish memorial are really very high. Um, that those slabs and that memorial is also a bit of a giant stumbling stone. And then we have all of the small sort of golden ones that are scattered throughout the city and throughout different towns across Germany and now across Europe. So there's a very nice connection there um, between the Jewish memorial and between the stumbling stones, even though they're unrelated projects. So maybe we'll, we'll take a moment there and uh, check in and see if there's any questions. But that's the story of the, of the stumbling stones. Thank you. No questions yet, Dion. None? Okay questions that you wanted to follow up with? Sure. Jennifer, I have a question which is related to the challenge we are having less related to how we honor and memorialize soldiers that fought for the Confederacy. Ah, uh, okay. Mm -hmm. so I'm wondering in Germany, obviously there were many young yeah. German boys and some women, I'm sure, who fought for, uh, for Hitler's army, who died, you know, fighting for this uh, mm -hmm. side. And I'm wondering how the German population um, deals with the fact that these were young men who were only asked to go out there and fight and were not necessarily white supremacists or Nazis necessarily, but how, how, do, how does German society honor or, or remember those fallen soldiers who fought yeah. for Hitler's army? Yeah. That's an excellent question, Dion, really. Um, so many books have been written about this, all kinds of cultural experiences, films and um, plays have been written to sort of explore this question. I think in the context of memorials, what I would like to start with is sort of the place where I began learning about that experience. The First World War is from 1914 until 1918. And there are also memorials across Germany, across Europe, of course, for the fallen soldiers from the First World War. 
And when the Second World War ended, there was a need, as you're acknowledging, there was a need for German families um, to acknowledge their fathers, their sons, their uncles, their brothers that had fallen for uh, during the war, basically, as soldiers at the front, for example, and on the battlefields. And so one of the ways, actually, remember as well that um, by the middle of 1945, Germany is divided into four different occupied zones. So, you know, the Russians occupied the eastern part of the country, and then the British and the American and the French occupied the western part of the country. And the way that it shook out in the western occupied countries is that these memorials that were established after the First World War, there was sort of a compromise that was reached where the Allies, so the British, the Americans, and the French, the Allies felt comfortable with allowing Germans, for example, to create engraved tablets with the names of their fallen soldiers. And then those tablets were often physically connected to the fallen soldiers from the First World War. Mm -hmm. So it created sort of a continuum. Mm -hmm. You have the fallen soldiers from World War I, and then that's continuing with the fallen soldiers of World War II. Um, that was one way that, one very concrete way that was, a, that was again, sort of a compromise. The, the Allies knew that they could not, it would be very, very difficult and create stress to say no to the remaining German population. You cannot honor or remember your, um, your sons, your uncles, your fathers, etc., in this way. And by connecting the World War II fallen soldiers to the World War I fallen soldiers, this was, this was, sort, of a, this was sort of a compromise. Um, however, that being said, there's a difference also in Germany between, between fallen soldiers. I guess this is another interesting aspect as well. When we talk about the structure of the victims and the bystanders and the perpetrators, there's a spectrum within each of those groups you a perpetrator might be considered to be the 18 year old german boy who is drafted towards the end of the war and sent to the front i mean technically in that framework that young boy who dies for yep. his country is considered to be a perpetrator yep. he however represents you know something very different than the camp commander of auschwitz yeah. And so there's a spectrum as well within within each of those within each of those groups. Um, so to um, to honor the fallen soldiers is sort of one part, but then people who, for example, who were SS members, which approximately ten percent were women. You actually acknowledged women as well in your question, um, even though the SS was primarily a male organization. It was also a voluntary organization. No one was ever drafted or forced into the SS against their will. Um, honoring publicly in memorials the SS, that's a very different thing in Germany, and you see very little of that. That's, um, that's something that's, that's kept extremely private, actually, still until today. Does that help? Yes. Jen, let okay. me just jump in quickly and say, yeah. if you're done sharing your screen, participants can't see you, so you can stop sharing screen. Oh, sorry. Okay. No problem. Right. Yeah, let's do that. Um, let me get back to that. And that actually is a nice uh, lead in. I can um, sort of sum up quickly. Great. Let's see. How do I get there, Eric? You um, should see a stop sharing screen option at the top of your Zoom call. Okay, give me just a second. Sorry about that. Oh, let me close this one. How's that? There you go. 
Okay. Um, and then actually that's a, that's a really nice, um, that's a really nice link actually to finishing that final picture that's on my handout is a picture of um, what in English is called topography of terror. This is topography des terrors. And this is the former SS headquarters in Berlin. So the headquarters of all of the SS headquarters um, across Nazi Europe. And this is actually also within walking distance actually from the Jewish Memorial. And this is the, an authentic historical site. This is actually where the headquarters once was. Um, it's a, it's um, quite a sizable area. I would say at least two like American football size field field size. And this is another grassroots movement where the idea started again in West Germany in the mid 80s. And just recently, it's actually come to fruition. And it looks exactly like the photograph. Uh, actually, just we took that just recently, um, which is now one of these learning centers on the actual site of where the perpetrators were. And so for the for the SS headquarters, this was an administrative uh, building. This was also, there was a prison there where um, mainly political prisoners that were speaking out against the Nazis were actually brought. So it was also a place to, of abuse and, and of torture and of killing. And today it has been completely transformed into this learning center where you can only now see the ruins of the building. Of course, Berlin was, was heavily bombed. 90% of the, of the city center, of course, was destroyed in Berlin. So there was very little left at the end of the war. Um, so what you can actually see there on site are the ruins and the, of the, um, of the, basically the cellar of these buildings that existed as the SS headquarters. And in English and in German is a permanent exhibit about the rise of Nazism and how the National Socialist period um, from start to finish, how everything developed. And then they also have a space there for special exhibits around special topics. And there's all kinds of guides that will take special groups around. There's audio guides. So it's really this very interactive place, place of learning. And that was the last place that I sort of wanted to highlight because I think often with these memorials and with these monuments, at least in the context of, of Holocaust history, remembering the genocide, there's often a focus on the victims, but it's important to highlight that in both Germany and in Austria, um, there is also what's included in this learning process. What's included is also space for the perpetrators. And Dion, that also connects back a little bit to your question that um, the Germans knew you know, once 20, 30 years had passed, the Germans knew that it was extremely important to bring in the, um, the voices as well and the experience of the perpetrators so that, especially so that, that Germans could actually learn from that experience. Um, but of course, as you say, it's extremely difficult to, especially in families, um, it's extremely difficult to separate sometimes who was the, for example, who was the SS commander and who was the father when they were, you know, together in one, per, in one person. There was actually a, a very famous novel, just as a side note, that's been translated into English. It was extremely popular in Germany um, more than 10 years ago. And the title is Opa war kein Nazi, which means grandpa was not a Nazi. And it's a novel, but it's, um, but it's also autobiographical, written by the grandson of a high-level um, SS, um, like a lieutenant, basically. And it was his experience that he had experienced a grandfather. He had never experienced an SS commander at home as he was growing up in the 60s, 70s, and 80s. And this was a, a bestseller in the German-speaking world and really shed a lot of light on the perpetrator experience and then the children and the grandchildren as well of the, of the perpetrators of the genocide. Wow. Uh, Jennifer, I have, uh, maybe it, it might be a, a, a question to take us to close with. Uh, okay as it relates to your TED talk, actually. Sure. Uh, when I've visited memorials, uh, whether it's the Holocaust Museum in uh, DC, <clears throat> mm -hmm. 
or the uh, Kigali Genocide Memorial in Rwanda. <clears throat> oh, good, yes. Mm -hmm. I, I walk away just weighted down with emotion and wondering about the students who, are, who will be watching this. Yeah. You know, we want, you know, just like the German high school students, we want them to visit the memorial, to know their history, to also have, be affected in some way. Yeah. Uh, and I'm just wondering if you can help us uh, think about what we do next when we leave those places and we're weighted down and we're feeling sad and we're feeling guilty and we have all of these mixed emotions. What can we yeah. do and what can young people do uh, after bearing witness uh, yeah. so and uh, either do something with that, that emotion in a productive way or, or, or move toward greater healing or whatever it might be. Just wondering well, how you think about yeah. that. Yeah. Yeah. It's such an important question, isn't it? Um, I think that what we've found, the projects that I've been involved in and the education that I've received, the experiences that I've had, creative self-expression is definitely a helpful way to handle the strong emotions that come up when, when, facing, um, when facing this darkness, really. Um, I think also simply to acknowledge to yourself, acknowledge to the people around you. Um, hopefully, maybe, well, sometimes people do experience the Holocaust Museum alone or experience these memorials alone, but I think that many people also experience them with, with small groups or with larger groups in the context of a class. So I think one, to acknowledge to yourself and to others that you have, that you, you have bared witness to this is already something that not everyone does. And that's already a huge start. And then as the strong emotions, um, as we process those, as we sit with those, um, again, creative forms to express that are often are often helpful that could be through writing that could be through you know there's so much digital storytelling that's happening now um, but also I think to give your give yourself space as well to to feel it um, and to know that by bearing witness by asking these questions in my humble opinion that's already doing something um i definitely my email address is by the way on our on my canvas profile page and um, i'll be back online again on november 11th um, for those students that are part of our course who might be particularly interested um, specifically maybe in coming to Europe or if you're already based here, um, if you're specifically interested in doing something Holocaust related um, anywhere in the world, please do reach out. Um, there's such a network of like-minded people and I think maybe that's, that's, another, um, that's another aspect that's so powerful in processing emotions is knowing that you're not alone with the emotional response. Um, it is a lot to take in. It is a lot to face that um, humanity is capable of such um, of such treatment of others and of such action and of such choices. Um, so please do reach out if you are specifically interested in doing anything that might be Holocaust related because worldwide there are so many projects both online and off that people can that people can participate in. And it does give you the sense, I think, when, at least for me, when I became more politically active, um, I was always very interested in social change. Um, it's, it's quite helpful to be involved with other people who are like-minded and to be involved with some of these projects because you're able to, to actually do something with your, do something with your energy. Um, I think that many of us often want to see change, don't we? And so um, even a conversation with someone who also deeply cares about these issues, that's also something, um, provided that it's you know that it's done sort of in a in a, in a mindful and a, in a respectful way. And then of course back to back to my TEDx talk. Um, for those of you that will watch it, you'll see that the continuum for me, the answer for me was actually cultivating empathy and cultivating compassion. Um, 
for me and for many of my peers, we spent so many years working with Holocaust survivors when they were older, in their 70s and their 80s and in their 90s. Um, you know, and essentially they were, they were you know, survivors of extreme, survivors of genocide and survivors of extreme human rights violations. And they, um, one of the things that we talked about often was if empathy and compassion can be cultivated in us um, as individuals and also in society, it's quite possible that, um, that we would minimize this violence that humans can have towards other humans and that we might make some of these, we might make more compassionate choices in our daily lives that would um, change the collective energy differently. And so um, I became quite interested in empathy and compassion. And of course, this is all now emerged, which is why I'm sitting here at a, at a mindfulness retreat, uh, learning how to cultivate the awareness, learning how to cultivate the compassion, because the scientists actually now know that these are skills. You're not just born as some altruistic sort of Mother Teresa, Dalai Lama kind of person, uh, not to diminish those people at all, um, and their offerings, but you're not just, the, the, the scientists now know that we're not just born into these altruistic personalities, um, and that compassion and empathy is, are actually skills, um, and some of you might have already actually had mindfulness courses or classes or exposure to mindfulness in your schools. Um, I'm thrilled for all of you who have had some of that exposure because the scientists now know that we can cultivate those skills the same way that we cultivate any other skills around language acquisition or math or sports or running or dance or whatever. And so for me, it's also quite encouraging that, um, that cultivating something like mindfulness, compassion, empathy is something that I can do. It's something that my brain can learn. Um, and uh, mindfulness is sort of out there in the mainstream now. So that's also um, the way that it's taking form in my life now. Thank you. I so appreciate that. Thank you. Thank you, Jen. Thank you, Dion. Thank you. We'll wrap up the webinar now. Um, the recording of this webinar will be posted in the class uh, by the end of the day today. And if you have follow-up questions, there is a question forum discussion on week two of the course where you can leave any questions that didn't get answered today. In the meantime, thank you both, Jen and Dion, and everyone have a great rest thank of you. the day. Thank you. Thanks.